Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Wood. I'm the chair of surgery at the University of Washington and a thoracic surgeon. And we're going to be t having a great topic today on emerging and game-changing technologies in, in the treatment of lung cancer. Uh, we've got a great panel in front of us, uh, so I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves. Dr. Lieberman? Hi, I'm Moish Lieberman from the University of Montreal in Montreal, Canada. I'm a general thoracic surgeon. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth David. I am a general thoracic surgeon uh, from UC Davis in Sacramento, California. Good morning. My name is Leah Backus. I'm a thoracic surgeon at Stanford University. So a reason that this is an important topic uh, is this is an exciting time in the treatment of lung cancer. Uh, almost every week uh, or certainly every month there's a new therapy, a new immunotherapy or a, a new uh, targeted therapy for patients with advanced stage lung cancer. Our radiation oncology colleagues have made advances in SBRT and proton therapy. But it's also a time that's uh, great for thoracic surgeons because there's a number of interventions that allow early detection or better treatment uh, to give us new tools to treat our patients with lung cancer. Um, so I'm going to turn to each of the panelists uh, who are each experts in their own way on these uh, areas of emerging technology and innovative treatments for lung cancer. I'm going to start with Dr. David. You know, Dr. David, from your perspective, what's the biggest recent advance in, in lung cancer? What, what's the biggest ticket item in terms of t our care for patients with lung cancer? Sure, well I actually think that um, probably in the last five years the biggest advance has um, been the introduction of the low dose CT screening for lung cancer. And um, as we all know the um, National Lung Screening Trial demonstrated a 20% uh, cancer specific mortality risk reduction uh, for patients who are appropriately screened, meaning the high-risk patients, um, significant, you know, 30-pack year smoking history. Um, and the advantage of, or the, the benefit of lung cancer screening for those highly selected patients is really the ability to identify cancers much earlier than we previously have, where we can have an earlier opportunity to intervene and improve their survival. So more patients with stage one lung cancer. Hopefully. And a potential for cure. Hopefully. The issue we have is really the technology is only as good as those who use it. And unfortunately, we are recognizing that we have some, some areas to improve upon in the way that screening is implemented. Of course. You know, Dr. Bacchus, I know you've had an interest in multiple ways that we can improve the care of patients with lung cancer, a variety of aspects of patient education, care pathways, early uh, recovery after surgery. What, what would you... Uh, identify as the things that you're interested in uh, in improving care of patients with lung cancer? Well, as you know, you know, we have a huge uptick in the way that we interact with patients using electronics and wearable devices and um, kind of real-time tracking and, and those sorts of adjuncts. And I'm really interested in harnessing some of that technology and there are lots of new companies out there that are marketing different platforms that are specifically geared towards uh, shepherding patients through that process from the in that entire perioperative period from their preoperative optimization um, there there are platforms um, that are mobile based apps that also follow the patients while they're in hospital uh, kind of keeping them on their own sort of self-reported metrics and then that will follow them in their in their recovery once they're out of the hospital with monitoring of wounds with facilitating um, uh, communications and milestones in the recovery that will ideally minimize some of the back and forth and take away some of the uh, unknowns for patients to make them feel more empowered uh, and really feel that they're taking charge of their own care. So that's terrific. It's uh, uh, innovative. How do we measure it? How, how, you know, how do we look at those interventions and know that we're making a difference for patients or, or, or know that the things that we're doing give value to the patient experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really valid point because on surface, you know, there's something to be said for the fact that patients do seem to like many of these interventions, but, you know, are they 
is that enough to, to, to justify their use, to justify the additional cost or any potential disruptions, if you will, in your normal patient care flow? Uh, and I think that we're still on the precipice of trying to figure out how best to measure the value to the overall care package of that patient. You know, does it actually translate into reduced uh, readmissions, hospital readmissions? Does it translate into better objectively measures of, of, of quality? Um, uh, or is it more solidly placed in the patient reported outcomes? Um, and, and if it is, that's fine, but we just have to define what those measures are. Yeah, terrific. So Dr. Lieber, I'll talk to you, I'll turn to you because we've been talking about early detection, we've been talking about patient experience, but you know, what are some of the, uh, the gadgets or, or the technological things that we, we have now as tools for better caring for patients with lung cancer? Well, it's a, I think it's a great question and it's a good segue uh, between the pre-op getting patients to the OR and the post-op, how to get them home and happy early. And in the OR, we're going to see more and more patients with small disease, maybe some late state, uh, very sick patients with very little tumors. And I think that technological advances in the OR have really been lagging, at least in thoracic surgery, compared to a lot of the other um, sub-disciplines of uh, surgery, and especially in the belly. Uh, we have been working a lot on energy devices for sealing small vessels uh, in uh, lobectomy or anatomical resection. And I think that we have to remember that we estimate the minimally invasive lobectomy rate in North America at around 30 percent. And that's pretty low for a procedure that's been around almost 25 years now. I think that we should be more in the 95, close to 100 percent, like in gallbladder surgery and colorectal surgery. And obviously there's something wrong with the procedure if only 30 percent of people are actually doing that. And I think there's the new technologies that are coming out that are being developed and being tested, uh, which may help people who aren't as comfortable getting around the pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, the fissure, uh, sealing these things with uh, devices that are not as bulky and clunky as vascular and, and parenchymal staplers. And I think that the way we do lobectomies today and the way we do them in five years may be very different. I'll tell you, the way I do a vats lobectomy today is completely different from the way I did it five years ago, and I think it's just faster and safer and more efficient, and the conversion rates are much lower when you have tools that are designed for us as opposed to designed for rectal surgeons or gynae surgeons. So that's great, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back and say, what are the advantages? Uh, and and how, do we, how do we assure safety for our patients as we're applying a new technology like a energy sealing device for, pulmon for the pulmonary artery? Great question. So I'd say the advantages are in a small pulmonary vessel that's very short where you don't have a good landing zone for a large stapler, you're able to take that vessel with safety and quickly without a lot of dissection. And that makes the operation safer and probably, although we don't know yet, redu reduces your conversion rate. It also may make people more comfortable with the procedure and therefore increase the incidence of uh, VATS or, or robotic or any minimally invasive approach to lobectomy or anatomic resection. How do we prove that safe? That's a very good question. I think that uh, technology in surgery has been often introduced without good trials looking at safety. Uh, we in our lab have been pushing the safety aspect of this and to be sure that we were ready to go. We did two ex vivo studies looking at uh, pulmonary artery safety. Then we went to the animal lab and did a 30-day survival on vats lobectomy. And then we did two phase one trials. First where we did lobectomies on open patients to prove it was safe. So if something happened, we were able to fix it. And then we did a vats lobectomy phase one trial to make sure it was safe in vats. And now we're at what I think is the last step. We're doing a prospective multi-institutional, three-country international study to show that this is actually safe. So I think that, you know, there's many ways to prove safety, but I think that we need to not only prove that it's safe, but also prove that it's doable in multiple institutions by multiple surgeons. And I think that, I hope that the way we're doing this is really bringing it to the forefront in a safe way where surgeons can feel that this is a viable option for their patients. Terrific. So. That leads to my next question for uh, Dr. David. Uh, so what Dr. Lieberman's been talking about are technological advances that make it easier to do some of the minimally invasive approaches, including robotic approaches for uh, lung resection. 
What are the advantages to robotic surgery and where do you see that going in the near future? Sure, I think that um, as Dr. Lieberman was mentioned, it was mentioning that we, we know that the rates of minimally invasive surgery for lung cancer are probably lower than where they should be, um, where we would all hope to see them given the advantages over open techniques for the patients. So I think one of the greatest advantages for the robot is actually the ease of learning and the ease of transition for a surgeon who perhaps hasn't had as much um, training in VATS or as much comfort. If the transition between an open technique um, and VATS may be a little bit more difficult than open technique to a robotic technique. So I think that's a, that's a potential advantage. Um, there is a downside with the robot with, in, in terms of uh, the cost. Um, there's significant hospital costs associated with the robot. And, um, you know, unfortunately right now we don't have um, any way to recoup that cost on the backside um, in terms of uh, reimbursement. So um, it's, you know, everything we do is has pluses and minuses, and certainly I think the robot is a great adjunct um, potentially for allowing more patients to have minimally invasive surgery. Terrific. Dr. Bacchus, uh, lymph node staging is so important in, in identifying the appropriate surgery or, or multidisciplinary care for somebody with lung cancer. What's on the horizon for how we can be better at lymph node staging? So I think that one of the areas for lymph node staging would be in the realm of like uh, trying to extrapolate from uh, breast cancer surgery um, with sentinel lymph node biopsies and uh, ways in which we can be um, more targeted in the way that we go about staging people. You know, currently we sort of go in and, and get all the lymph nodes that are gettable kind of thing. Um, and uh, we think that we do a pretty good job of, of it as long as you get all the nodes kind of thing. But uh, is, is, that, is, is that necessary for all patients, right? Uh, and it's probably particularly important as we're talking about just to sort of go back to the beginning of the conversation when we're talking about early stage lung cancer patients, right? We know that our survival rate for a stage one lung cancer patient is not 99%, which is what it should be, you know? Uh, and why is that? Because our staging system, no matter even with its current iteration, is still not perfect. So there's something there that we're missing. Uh, and perhaps something like using intraoperative adjuncts to be more pointed about the way in which we stage patients uh, may actually uh, give us better accuracy and identify patients for whom adjuvant therapy may be most appropriate. And the way that we can do that would be to use some of the other, uh, some of the borrow, if you will, some of the techniques from the breast cancer um, arena um, using uh, like uh, near infrared, um, um, near infrared fluorescence um, and other sort of intraoperative um, localization and visualization techniques to identify those nodes that are important for that patient. So sentinel lymph nodes for lung cancer. Yeah. Got it. Right. So Dr. Lieberman, uh, take us to the next steps. Uh, when are we going to start treating lung cancers through the bronchoscope? Uh, are, are we going to have to still do the open surgery that you're talking about, or can we start to treat lung cancer with bronchoscopic ablation? I'm happy you asked me that. That's something I'm really excited about and we're really interested in in our lab, uh, both uh, in the animal and clinically. I think that we're still far away, so I don't think you, you need to sell your uh, robots or bats uh, equipment, but uh, I think that endoscopic ablation, whether it's by microwave, uh, radio frequency, uh, heat, uh, cryo, there's many different options for energy sources for endoscopic ablation and there are many labs working on that currently. I think that it will eventually shake out to be part of the armamentarium, sort of surgery, SPRT, endoscopic ablation. We know that in most hospitals percutaneous ablation has sort of gone by the wayside because of the risks and the SPRT being so minimally invasive and I think that 
we have to think of endoscopic ablation as not a competitor with SBRT or surgery, but as something complementary in a patient who has multiple tumors or previous surgery or who has SBRT in certain areas and can't get any more radiation or they can't get any more surgery and it sort of gets us out of uh, trouble. And I, if, if you think about uh, SBRT, you know, a lot of people at the beginning were very worried that this was going to take over from lung cancer surgery and we'd lose all our patients. And I think most of us nowadays are really happy that SBRT is around because when you see a patient that you really don't want to operate on, you have SBRT. And I think that endoscopic ablation will somewhere fit into that. The hardest part of endoscopic ablation is getting to the tumor. And not just to it, but making sure you're able to kill it in multiple zones. So if you have a small tumor of five millimeters, you could kill right around it, you'll be fine. But if you're trying to kill a three centimeter tumor, putting a probe right in the middle isn't enough. And when you navigate through the airway or through the parenchyma by an endoscopic route, it's not as easy as you would think. So the SPRT guys are lucky, they can go wherever they want. We have to sort of navigate through what's available and the parenchyma with the vessels and everything else that's there. Um, so I guess stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of trials, I think, coming out that we'll see at the next meetings. But uh, I don't think it's uh, here for tomorrow, for sure. Well, thank you. Well, as you can see, this is an exciting time for the treatment of patients with lung cancer. We have early detection uh, that Dr. David talked about, giving us an opportunity to treat more stage one lung cancers, uh, improvements in staging, uh, and improvements in the patient experience uh, that uh, Dr. Bacchus gave us information about, and some te technological advances in sort of how we can care for patients better uh, that Dr. Lieberman, Lieberman described. So I want to thank each of the panelists, uh, Dr. David, Dr. Bacchus, and Dr. Lieberman uh, for being with us uh, today. And uh, it's a great time to be a thoracic surgeon and, and doing our best to create lung cancer survivors. Thank you.